Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Joshua Benjo, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction uh, for this crowd. But uh, anyway, he's been researching neural nets for a long time and how they can learn and what role gradients uh, play with, uh, with training and uh, how to improve that. Uh, he has been involved as well in the design of uh, Tiano in the early days and uh, all the, has uh, provided support for its development, maintenance until uh, the, the framework and all the ecosystem that we have today. And uh, now he's uh, going to talk about running rules for, for neural nets and, and, and the system that go beyond the simple uh, backpropagation of the exact regions. Thank you, Pascal, and um, thank you for attending this presentation. Um, so the connection with automatic differentiation will be somewhat loose, um, but I'll try to share some, some thoughts on credit assignment, which is one of uh, the questions I care most about. Um, and uh, start with a few plugs. So the deep learning book is, is out, as some of you already know, and um, the chapters will remain for free online. Um, also, we just got this huge grant at the University of Montreal and we're looking for new professors, postdocs, PhDs, and grants. Uh, and uh, many other things are happening in Montreal. Uh, com companies uh, like Google and Elementi are also recruiting and many others are coming. So uh, it looks like it's going to be a great place to do deep learning in the next uh, few years. Okay, so now let me let me focus on um, the main topic here, but um, talk more generally first about the credit assignment principles, which which we find in, in machine learning. Um, the the one that most of you are aware of, of course, is, is backdrop, with, which is an application, a particular form of application of the chain rule, which gives gives us exact gradients with respect to parameters. Uh, by you know, getting ready to the intermediate states. Um, but some issues with backdrop that would motivate uh, alternative explorations. Uh, it's not always uh, computable. Uh, and maybe it's, uh, the exact gradients can be tractable because we have to run um, very large sums. Or maybe um, it's not useful. For example, if the, your computation graph includes uh, discrete operations, then you get zeros. Uh, you'd like to get some information about you know, in which direction your parameters should change, nonetheless. Um, and that uh, arises from um, the fact that really what Greedy is telling us, what Backrop is telling us, is if we were to make an infinitesimal move, um, in which direction we should go. But in reality, we're going to make a slightly bigger move. Um, and so the optimal um, non infinitesimal change may not be the same as the gradient that of course also motivates um, second order methods and things like that. Um, one thing that's been uh, well established in recent years is how we can combine noisy operations uh, inside uh, not just neural nets but in general in the gradient computation. Um, that's fairly trivial once you think about it. Um, but what was not trivial is the experimental evidence that uh, very, very stochastic forms, very noisy forms of, uh, of gradient descent actually work very, very well. Um, and um, yeah, one, one other direction of investigation which I won't talk much about is uh, backdrop as it stands um, is uh, making nice compromises in terms of memory and computation. But what it doesn't give us is a sort of online algorithm where you don't have to wait for the later um, um, events uh, in the sequence of computation in order to make updates. Um, it is in principle possible using forward accumulation, but that poses a big problem in terms of both memory and computation. And there are already some interesting lines of work, like Jan Olivier's, to try to um, uh, come up with estimators of the gradient, which uh, Proceed like forward accumulation, but are computationally feasible. Um, now, um, there are other. It's interesting to to really 
think about credit assignment to consider what are the other ways of estimating how, say, hidden layers should be changing. Um, and of course, one major way which actually was uh, came up before our backdrop is the ideas you find around Boltzmann machines, uh, which allow you, in principle, to estimate the gradient of the log likelihood in a stochastic way, but that involves running a Monte Carlo Markov chain, which, when the model is 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 uh, getting better, getting uh, sharper um, estimations of the probability, uh, becomes unreliable with high variance. Um, and interesting to think about it is basically relying on a kind of iterative relaxation. And you'll see later what I'll talk about um, also relies on some form of iterative relaxation as a means to uh, estimate gradients. Um, there are other approaches to uh, assignment, mostly coming from reinforcement learning, like reinforce and actor critic approaches. Um, reinforce, even though it's been working better than I would have expected, uh, I don't think is going to scale, even with a baseline. Um, you can think really of it as um, related to methods that do stochastic perturbations and then try to correlate those perturbations with the reward or the, the cost that you're trying to optimize. Um, and the reason they don't scale is that the amount of noise that comes in is uh, essentially linear with the number of noise sources. So in the case of a neural net, if you do that for every neuron or every, even worse, for every um, weight, then the amount of noise will grow linearly with the, the number of, of parameters or the number of neurons. So that's not going to scale to very large nets. Um, actor critic, uh, also from reinforcement, is better uh, in many ways. Um, and trades off some of the variance that you have with reinforce in exchange for bias. Um, so I, I think there's, there's something to, to explore further. Um, but in practice, Backrub has been really winning over all the other credit assignment methods. Um, and um, uh, that's even more true when you consider all the ways that it's been improved using, for example, adaptive running rate techniques and natural gradient or momentum-like techniques. Um, so it's interesting to try to think about why is it that backup is working so much better than all the other credit assignment methods? Um, and another thing that I have the answer, but my intuition is that the, the main reason why backup is so efficient uh, in the sense of, you know, telling us where to move um, is that it's really only considering one direction in the space of parameters, or the space of whatever you're trying to optimize. And it's the direction of the gradient. Uh, so it's not wasting time uh, exploring other directions. Um, of course, there's the other aspects, which is that you have an exact and efficient computation gradient. But, um, but uh, as I said earlier, even stochastic versions of gradient descent work really well. Um, and there are many other um, credit assignment methods which, which are stochastic, but don't work nearly as well. Right, so um, one of the things uh, that has bothered me for a while, even since I was working in the uh, recurrent nets in the early 90s, and I tried to understand why it was hard to train them when the sequences were very long, so that's the vanishing and exploding gradient problem and long-term dependencies, um, is that um, when you compose a large number of nonlinear computations, then the, the result is something even more nonlinear. Right? So if you imagine composing many signals together, you get something that becomes like a discrete function. And of course, as I said earlier, if you had a discrete function to optimize over, uh, backprop and gradient in general isn't going to be very helpful. So as we consider more nonlinear computation, uh, it becomes harder and harder to train these nets. The only reason that uh, things like ResNet is uh, working is because they're cheating. Uh, in other words, you have essentially skip connections, and through the skip connections, you have information flowing and making it easier to train these things. But, but actually, if you consider the long path that goes through the non-areas, uh, I suspect that um, the residents are not able to extract that kind of information because uh, those gradients are probably tiny in comparisons to the, the gradients that mostly go through the skip connections. Um, so, what's going on here? Um, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so that comes back to the issue of how we could estimate um, the effect of small but not infinitesimal changes. And I, I don't claim that I have the answer to this question today, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll tell you about some related things. Um, and for both machines, well, uh, I've studied them quite, quite a bit over the last few years as well. And um, unfortunately, the way that we're doing credit assignment involves relaxation, which is not so bad. But uh, the bad part is that um, that relaxation requires essentially uh, uh, getting enough unbiased sample and clean samples from the MRK of chain, which becomes which which becomes very difficult to sample from efficiently as the model becomes better. So as as the probability density estimated by the model becomes uh, sharper, uh, our graded estimator gets worse. And it gets worse because the chain that's mixed between nodes, uh, it, it, it's going to you know, move from state to state. This is the x-axis in the figures. Um, and it's going to tend to stay in the high probability modes. And the probability of jumping from one node to another is going to become sort of exponentially small as, as those modes get more and more separated by low probability regions. So we, I'm not saying both machines as a policy model are wrong, but the way that we're training them, um, I think, doesn't work for this reason. Um, one thing that I've been exploring a bit in, uh, a couple of years ago is the idea of uh, target propagation or difference target prop, which works uh, better. Um, and um, you can think of it as a, a biologically motivated approach to try to do something like back prop. So imagine you have feed forward uh, uh, computation with the Fs here, so this is like two layers of a uh, deep layer neural net. And you have feedback connections in red here with the Gs. And let's say that uh, in the feedforward computation, we have, we've computed these Hs. So Hi is the layers uh, I, layer I uh, activations. And now, let's say somebody were to tell you not the gradient, but uh, a kind of target, right? So Hi hat. Uh, so if Hi hat was infinitesimally close to Hi, then this would be equivalent to that problem. Um, but let's say it's uh, you know not exactly uh, uh, so close, but uh, you'd like the H i minus one to change in a direction H hat uh, i minus one, uh, which would get you close to H uh, i hat. So we've come up with a very simple. Uh, um, method here to estimate hi hat minus one, which has the property that um, if the lower layers uh, were able to satisfy that target, uh, then you would get closer to the target at the next stage. So, and there's some reasonable assumptions about the relationship between f and g, which actually even hold for uh, most choices, random choice of g, but really work well if, if uh, f and g are in a kind of order and quarter relationship. Um, so I'm not going to spend more time on this, but uh, uh, people in neuroscience in particular have been picking up on, on this and trying to uh, come up with biological implementation of these kinds of things to try to make uh, sort of biologically plausible backdrop implementation. But I'm going to tell you about another attempt to make uh, a biologically plausible implementation of backdrop, uh, and this is uh, going to be the crux of what I'll talk about for the rest of my presentation, I think. Um, yeah, this is work with Benjamin Sellier and we uh, um, call this paper Equilibrium Propagation, um, bridging the gap between energy based models and back propagation. But, but really, I realized just in the last couple of month, months that this is something that goes beyond uh, biology and could provide a new principle for estimating gradients in physical systems um, that have parameters and that we'd like to optimize. So what do I mean by a physical system? So I mean uh, something like that obeys the laws of physics, right? Uh, that works in continuous time, so it's a dynamical system in continuous time. Uh, and um, furthermore, I'm going to assume that the, the, the dynamics of that system uh, essentially bring it to minima of the Lyapunov function or an energy function. Uh, and we'd like to change the parameters of that system so that the dynamics go in better places according to some cost function. And the cost function should be something we can measure, like say prediction error on some uh, of the variables in the system. Um, 
And, uh, and the question is, how do we estimate the gradient? In other words, how do we change the parameters so that after the system has relaxed to a local minimum of the energy or a, a, an equilibrium in the case of stochastic, uh, how do we make sure that uh, you know, we change the parameters in the right direction? So there are connections to back parameters, of course, but there are also connections to those machines which are also similar systems that uh, relax to some equilibrium distribution. Um, and so it's kind of interesting, I think, this work because it's different from both the both machine and, and backprop, but it, it has interesting relation to both of them. Okay, so we have this energy function, and in fact, I'm going to assume that it's essentially unknown, right? So, you know, you have a, like a, a circuit or you have a, a uh, you know, a physical device and it obeys some you know, physical laws, but you don't know precisely what these laws are, right? But you know that there exists an energy function and uh, the system converges to states of low energy, either deterministically or probabilistically. And if it's probabilistical, that means that the, the state has a distribution uh, after it's settled that's uh, with probability uh, proportional to the e to the minus energy, okay? So this is the main thing I'm going to assume, and I'm going to assume later that I'll be able to measure some quantities in that system that are going to help me to find out what the gradient is. And those quantities are always called sufficient statistics, so the derivative of the energy with respect to um, parameters. Whereas here, I'm talking about the derivative of the energy with respect to states, right? So we have states, parameters, and energy. And there's also costs, which depends on the behavior of the system uh, as measured at some places. So, uh, to make things a little bit more concrete, imagine, say, a multi-layer neural network, but now it's, it's, um, it's really uh, like a recurrently connected network um, um, uh, that has dynamics that are governed by minimizing some energy function. But that, uh, that neural net, say, but it could be any kind of physical system, as I said, um, is also connected to the outside world. And so um, and the outside world is trying to tell the system something, sending some signals in. So uh, we're decomposing the total energy function, F, into an internal energy, which I know E here, um, which only depends on what's going on inside the system and on the parameters and an external energy which tells us how the outside world is pushing on the inside world, sending signal to the inside, uh, to the inside of the network or the system. So one example is shown with this uh, sum of quadratics where I have two kinds of x's and y's, the internal ones and the external ones, and, um, and the external uh, world is pushing with a strength beta, so you can think of that as like a bunch of strings, right, as squared terms, uh, and um, the outside world is actually pulling with the, 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 the string strength um, beta x or beta y. So if, if I choose, for example, beta x equal infinity, then I push it, you know, I, I, I force the internal x to equal the outside x. And if I say beta y equals zero, then basically the output values y are free, and this is useful if I want to make a prediction with that system. I want, I want actually the system to compute something. Uh, if I said beta y equals infinity, then I would also clamp the outputs. If I said beta y equals epsilon, a small positive number, and that's a new thing, uh, that means I'm just nudging the outputs towards uh, a value that would make the prediction closer to the target. So the predicted y to the target y. And we're going to be using this, of course. And so there's these betas that control uh, how much pressure we put Inside using the outside um, values. So this is different from normal backprop in the sense that the uh, costs that we're trying to minimize with the objective function is uh, an implicit function of the parameters. So I don't have like an analytic formulation. I can't do backprop through this. Uh, but yet I would like to compute the gradient still because I want to learn the parameters of this. Uh, and the implicitness comes from this thing here that I'm saying that uh, the, the state uh, I end up in, with the, the state that I'm going to care about is the local minimum of this energy function. Just a local minimum doesn't have to be local minimum. So it should be easy to find a local minimum. Um, and, uh, and we have this theorem which initially required a few pages of math and now it stands in just a few lines which uh, I'm going to explain in words, um, and it says the following thing. 
the gradient of the objective function with respect to the parameters, so the, 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 taking into account the whole thing, right, the implicit computation, is equal to this, you know, uh, difference uh, limit of the, this epsilon goes to zero of one over epsilon th that difference. So it looks like, you know, uh, definition of a gradient, except that notice that on the left hand side we have a gradient which is uh, with respect to theta, which is this very high dimensional vector of parameters, and on the right hand side the limit is on a scalar with psi, which is, so that's much easier to deal with, right? It's just a scalar. Uh, that that uh, controls how much pressure the outside world is putting on the inside. Right? So now we've turned uh, to the traditional formula for, say, finite difference distribution of the gradient, in which on the right hand side we, we would have to look at all the parameters. Uh, here we're only looking at the effect of a one dimensional change. So this is a really powerful thing. Uh, and that one dimensional change is the change that rises, so between the, 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 the left and the right terms of the sum here, or the difference, what we change is just this psi, which changes the beta, the, the, the amount of influence, by a small, uh, in some direction, delta, by, by a scalar psi. So psi controls how much we change the influence. So whatever the influence we put on the network, if we change it by a little epsilon in some direction, then we can measure the gradient. Um, and so uh, the um, let's see if I have like the recipe to use this would be something like uh, we would start with uh, say if you want to do supervised learning you have two betas the beta x is always going to clamp to infinity so the inputs are clamped uh, but the, for the y's uh, we're going to start by letting them free so this is the maxi prediction so b to y equals zero and then in the positive phase we're going to set b to y equals epsilon. So when we are in the negative phase, we're going to let the system relax to its prediction. So it, you know, it minimizes the energy. It finds some local energy. It doesn't matter which one, actually. And then there could be many. That's actually fine. Um, and then we read out the prediction, measure the, the, the cost, um, and measure sufficient statistics. So these are the, the quantities that uh, we need to be able to measure. And usually, these are fairly simple things. Uh, I'll give an example later. And then, uh, once we've done that, we're going to nudge, slightly push the, the outputs y towards a value corresponding to a slightly lower value of the cost. In other words, we're pushing the outputs towards the target by just epsilon. And that's correspond to choosing this beta y equals epsilon. Um, and then, again, we let the dynamics converge, but now we've changed the situation very little, so it's only going to move very slightly, right? We were at the minimum, but we changed the, the energy function ever so slightly, so the minimum is going to move a little bit by continuity. And at that new position, we're going to measure the suspicion statistics again. Uh, and we take the difference, and we're done. Uh, so, um, so that's sort of the, the framework in which this could be used. Um, the theorem also has a stochastic version, which uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go in detail, but by the way, uh, how much time do I have? Six minutes? Okay. Uh, including questions? Then the questions, good. Um, right, so I explained the main theorem, and there's basically the, the stochastic version is the same, you just stick in expectations in the right places. In other words, you have to sample rather than go to a minimum. Um, but it's the same story. And um, so what's cool about this is that we don't actually have to know the energy function anywhere. We just need to be able to measure things. Uh, we need to be able to, 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 to get those sufficient statistics, but yeah, that's all. Uh, so if you, say, build uh, like an analog circuit or some kind of physical device that was minimizing some given energy, uh, even if you don't know exactly what the device is computing, you can still train it because you can measure what it does, you can nudge it, and see how it would change the sufficient statistics. Okay? So uh, you don't need to calibrate. So the typical thing people do when they build like, analog devices is that they will try to design the physics so that it approximately implements some idealized uh, equations. But here it's the other way around. You know, whatever the system does, we're asking the question, how do we change this parameter so that it does it better? Um, yeah, so I mentioned that already. 
Um, the connection to BACPRA uh, was actually something, this is how we started uh, that research. So it's an earlier paper, earlier paper with uh, Asia Fisher. Um, if, you, if you think again about the same kind of setup, uh, and you think about the perturbation that you're applying on the output. So we have a system that has settled, it has these uh, bi-directional weights, think of it like a recurrent net. It has settled to some configuration after you clamp the input and it produces some outputs. And now I'm gonna just push the outputs a little bit towards a better value. So that's the nudging, the perturbation. You can study how that perturbation propagates uh, in, in the micro instance after you, you, you make the perturbation. And the, the cool thing is that it propagates just like backpack. So if you look at the perturbations in the lower layers, uh, they will be proportional to the, the gradients that, 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 that we are after. Now, of course, this, this paper is kind of incomplete because we don't want to know just what's happening in the micro instance following the perturbation, but you know, where things are going and, and we wanted to actually have a gradient, and this is the, the, on the parameters, which is what the, the previous theorem gives us. Um, yeah, um, yeah, let me skip that part. Um, there, I won't go into this, all this uh, ugly math, but uh, there are also uh, interesting connections between the, the framework we proposed and, and the Boston machine more like your gradient, um, uh, which correspond essentially to, instead of making uh, infinitesimal pressure, putting uh, infinite pressure on, on the uh, on the outputs. Um, yes, there are also some interesting connections. There's too much text here; I don't even bother trying to read it. Between this and, and biology, as I said, and in fact, this was one of the motivations in the first place. Um, if you choose as an energy function something like a half field energy function, which has these quadratic terms, just, just like in both machines. Um, you end up with a, a weight update, which is uh, sort of a temp uh, uh, differential Hebbian thing, where the weight change in the positive phase should be proportional to the product of the pre and post synaptic firing rates. Uh, um, so this is something that's very easy to measure and uh, also happens to uh, match spike timing the elasticity updates that people have. Um, uh, assumed uh, what is going on in, in, in biological synapses, but yeah, we don't really know what's going on in biological synapses. Um, the only issue in terms of biology is that uh, you need these symmetric weights, um, which isn't really directly plausible, but I, I think there are some solutions to this. So it's also an interesting direction to study how winds could uh, implement that crop. Something equivalent. Now, there are still uh, a lot of open problems uh, flowing up on this. Uh, it's not totally clear actually how to implement this in an electric circuit because uh, when you have electricity flowing in a circuit, right, you have continuously sending uh, current into it. Uh, actually, there is no equilibrium in terms of uh, the positions and velocities of electrons. They, they keep flowing all the time. The only kind of equilibrium is in terms of currents and voltages. And there isn't always a Lyapunov function corresponding to those quantities. Uh, but I believe that it is possible to design circuits for which there is a Lyapunov yeah, function, but that remains to be explored further. Um, one thing that I don't like about this formulation is that uh, it, it relies heavily on this notion of having an energy function, and, and as in the example of actual uh, electric circuits, there isn't always an energy formulation, but there's always a dynamics. And so one interesting extension of this is, can we do the same thing when the system we're trying to optimize uh, is you know, only specified by its dynamics. And how do we change the parameters of the dynamics so that it, it does what we want? Um, so, and then another kind of extension which I can go really, uh, hand in hand with that is how do we extend these ideas to unsupervised life? So this is something that I'm currently exploring. Um, all right, um, so um, thank you very much. And uh, this is a picture of the many people in, in uh, Montreal working on machine learning at uh, Mila. Thank you very much. And I'll be very glad to answer questions about this or other things. <laughs> yes. Yeah.
activities we have for them don't work. I mean, they work for small scale models, and but um, yeah, uh, they, they, we don't have good ways of training larger ones. Essentially, I believe for the reason that I talked about that. Uh, in order to get a gradient with the existing methods, you need to sample from the model to the markup chain, and, and those samples need to cover all the modes of the distribution uh, frequently enough, and that's very really hard. And so we need to find other ways of training them. So if you're interested in both machines, then you should think about like new algorithms, not like how to apply it. Yes? So, um, one of these uh, running base networks need to update the parameter of each layer. Yes, so one of the running base methods need to update the parameter of each layer from the top layer to the, to the, to the, the, the first layer. It means it's very difficult to parallelize the update process. So is there, like, do, do you think is it possible to update the parameter at each layer independently? Very good question. Yes, yes, I'll repeat the question. So if I understand, it, the question is um, that the backdrop in the multi-layer network, and I think it would be especially true on very deep uh, multi-layer networks, requires uh, this sort of sequential computation across the layers. And uh, we have to wait for the signal coming back before we can do updates, and we have to um, yeah, to do, to do a lot of this, you know, waiting and, and special computation. So in terms of implementation, of course, there are ways to pipeline or uh, do things in parallel across examples. Um, and, but one, one thing that I find fascinating is the question, could we do an update even before we get the gradient? So there was some very recent work from uh, Design um, exploring how we could learn to estimate the gradient before it comes back. Uh, I, I worked on an idea like this a couple of years ago for recurrent nets. So I think for recurrent nets it would be particularly interesting. That's connected to the question I asked at the beginning. Can we do an online update even before we see you know, the, the feedback gradient coming from the future? Uh, and, uh, and the idea that I explored then and that the DeepMind uh, people have implemented it and really made work in, in the, in the feedback case is that you train sort of a, a bunch of little mini networks at each layer, which try to estimate what the gradient will be, and then you can uh, use that estimated gradient to do a first update, and then uh, use the, the true gradient when it comes to update your, your model so that it does a better job next time. Uh, so this kind of idea, I think, is, is quite interesting and is uh, worth pursuing. Thank you. Yes? Uh, well, when I took my class of uh, physics in uh, first year of university, we studied all kinds of systems with uh, you know, springs and masses and stuff. And um, they all uh, are defined by an energy function. So any kind of such systems uh, essentially do work. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, uh, electrical circuits are not in this category. Uh, at least if you think about the, the, the masses and positions and velocities of, of atoms and electrons. Um, and, but but I, I do believe that it is possible to design circuits that would have similar properties. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a physicist, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, extrapolating from what I know, I think there are lots of potential uh, applications if if the system uh, you know, actually obeys some uh, differential equations corresponding to whose minima are, are uh, some function. Um, okay, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, well, measuring the states isn't too hard because it's a physical quantity, but the thing that I didn't explain is how do you measure the sufficient statistics? 
So there's actually a very simple solution to this where you don't need to know the energy function. Because the thing is, if you actually have like a machine, right, that's like a physical thing, well, what is its energy function? Maybe you can guess more or less what it is by, you know, physics uh, knowledge, but you're not going to have the true energy function. So here's the trick. Um, let's say you consider your parameters as variables, just like the other state variables. And then you, the same way that I've tied the uh, inputs and the outputs through a string to some target values, I can tie those parameters, which are now state variables, to some stored value, which are like the true value of the parameters. So in other words, what I'm saying is make the parameters as they are used in the system free quantities, but tie them through a spring to the, the true value, which is the current value like for the parameters. So now what's going to happen? When I'm going to make a perturbation on the output, that's going to put some pressure on those three variables, but you know, they're also tied to the, uh, the true value. And, and the difference between you know, before I apply the perturbation and after I apply the perturbation, how much those parameters move, give me exactly the sufficient statistics. And the reason is very simple, because the, uh, that change is basically the gradient of, of, the, uh, of the energy with respect to the, uh, the parameters. Right? This is how much the system wants the parameters to change, is how much they resist the outside value. So the change in the parameter due to the perturbation is now going to give you exactly the sufficient so if, if your physical system is one in which you can like tie springs or the equivalent, right, then you can compute the sufficient statistics without ever knowing the true energy function in, in any analytic way. Okay, thank you very much.